Hello, everybody. Welcome to OpenCV Weekly Webinar. And today I have with me Mr. Zach uh, Bilta, who is a research scientist at the University of Southern California. And he is a participant in OpenCV Spatial AI competition. Uh, welcome, Zach. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Great. And he's going to show us a great example of how you can solve real world problems using um, the OpenCV AI kit light, OBD light. And this actually helps him and his lab mates solve uh, a problem counting, you know, uh, particles or what do we call it? Uh, these are bacterial particles? Uh, bacteria, CFU is a good term for it. Okay, CFU uh, in a Petri dish. So uh, that's, that's the topic of uh, the conversation today. And also with us is Phil Nelson, who is the content manager at OpenCV. Welcome, Phil. If anything goes wrong, it's Phil's mistake. <laughs> That's usually the case. Yes, uh, the man of the hour, the man with the power, too sweet to be sour. I'm still here, everybody. Uh, if this is your first time joining us, or if you've been here since day one, this is episode 45, by the way. Wow. There's a few things we do here that you should know about. One is we use the Zoom Q&A functionality during the show. So use that little Q&A button in the bottom of your screen to ask a question if you have one at any time during the webinar. And we'll do our best to fill it into conversation, conversation or uh, save some time at the end to uh, ask ones that we couldn't get to during the regular presentation. We'll also be doing a very special giveaway from our thanks to our sponsors at Microsoft Azure of uh, 200 hours of uh, Microsoft Azure credit on their uh, awesome Intel hardware. So stay tuned for that. That's great. So um, Zach, uh, the show is yours. Uh, you could uh, give a shorter you, you could give a short introduction beyond what I had given, so that people get to know you better, and then we can start uh, the slides. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Phil. Um, and for running this, uh, and Satya, um, as well for putting this on. Um, so I'm Zach, and I uh, am a research uh, technician at the University of Southern California, and basically working with um, sort of antibiotic-resistant bacteria. I'm originally from Iowa, actually. I just moved to California uh, back in July, and I did my undergrad, my graduate work at um, the University of Iowa, and uh, I moved here because, you know, I wanted uh, the sunshine, but also because um, it really seemed like they were doing some important work and I wanted to be a part of that. And so um, a little introduction to the project, um, you know, the counting of these uh, CFUs was um, something that everyone in, this, in, in the lab I'm currently in does. And, and we do, uh, it's done sort of manually. Um, there are sort of more automated style tech techniques um, like uh, apps and um, large expensive robots, um, but not, they're either very expensive, very large, or um, maybe not quite as accurate as uh, we'd hoped. So at the time it's uh, done manually and it's done manually by um, many labs um, around the world. So- uh, What does uh, CFU what, stand for? So it stands for colony forming unit. It okay. is the, uh, well, we'll get we'll get to that uh, shortly. Okay. Um, uh, but right for uh, for right now, the uh, I just wanted to say that the uh, yeah, when, whenever I'm stuck with the problem of uh, sitting in say counting 100, 200 uh, small dots, I, my mind starts thinking like maybe this is something that uh, a non-human would like to do better. So with that, I said I will uh, start the show here or the slideshow here. I think the same thing when I'm counting hundreds of dots. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just shared the uh, Zoom, did I? No, we can see you. <clears throat> we can see the okay. uh, we can see the slides here. Okay. Yep, looks good. So um, my team is Elliot Inoculum. Feel free to uh, follow us on Twitter. And by us, I mean me. Um, today, I'll be showing you the Petri dish scanner I've been working on uh, to count bacteria and um, I think it also opens the door for uh, a lot more uh, projects similar to this um, beyond counting bacteria. And I could maybe touch on that at, uh, later in the uh, episode as well. So to begin with, I, I wanted to quickly define inoculum since it turns out it's not a hugely um, regular term. Um, it's basically 
the material that is um, transferred from one media to the biological material that's transferred from one medium, whether it be a liquid medium, um, nutrient rich uh, liquid medium to uh, more of an agarose sort of jello type medium, or it can be transferred um, what you might uh, know as vaccine from um, a vaccine into a person or into an animal. It's just, um, th it's the transferring of this uh, biological material to get a, an immune response or to uh, just sort of in introduce a, a foreign substance. So in microbiology, the inoculum is the uh, transferred biological material. And um, we often use liquid, me liquid media to kind of grow up large numbers of this bacterium, but then it can be transferred to an agar, agar plate um, to um, more specifically focus on uh, single colonies, single CFU, um, to be able to control for their different, for example, genetic makeup of the bacteria that we're looking for. It's important to, that this process is done um, in a sterile environment because bacteria are small and there's bacteria all around us. And so um, we often use heating flames um, from a gas burner in order to, to keep this process sterile when we're both handling the liquid media as well as the agar. So in order to deal with these um, bacteria, um, if I were to grow up a bacteria in a liquid media overnight, I. I there could be just billions of uh, these cells. And um, it's important that you know, it's in science as well as engineering and everything that we, we stay, uh, that we can be uh, quantity wise, very precise. So when we have these billions in a solution, you gotta do um, the, you gotta do the Carl Sagan voice, billions and billions. <laughs> billions and billions. Uh, it's important that we kind of get a handle on this number and we're not gonna be able to do that um, with billions and billions. Um, so we, we often have to quantify them somehow. And um, much like you would a drug dosage or um, a viral load, or um, in this example, a bacteria, we would do a what's known as a serial dilution, meaning um, one after the other in a row um, dilutions. So basically you can just dilute, um, you know, tenfold over and over again, so that rather than having, you know, hundreds of millions of colonies on these plates, like my arrows are pointing to, these are uh, uncountable amount. Um, if you had more, it might even be called what we refer to as a lawn, which is basically just one solid, um, just lawn, you know, grass of, uh, of bacteria. And the reason that's, a, that's sort of an issue is because um, each one of these CFUs, which is sort of these dots on these plates, represents a genetically or one cell that has propagated into a colony. So they're not, this isn't one cell we're looking at. It's a um, colony forming unit. So it's many, many, many of the same cell. So this is the same genetic makeup that is sort of propagated into this visible sort of glob. Um, and so if we begin to get these lawns forming where all these different globs are kind of smushing together, um, it can become a problem because we kind of lose control over um, the the uh, the the genetic makeup of the of the cells that we're working with. They would just become because each one of these colony forming units sort of has the ability to mutate slightly. So there's just a, a variety of different, um, slightly different or more than slightly different genotypes going on. So it's important that we can isolate one colony forming unit that has sort of a homogenous uh, genotype. So we dilute it down until we get to a countable number, say 159 colonies. You can count lower, but once you get down to like 17 or two, zero, that um, becomes more statistically inaccurate as you uh, get to the, such a low number. So, you know, but 159 is something that, you know, humans can count, we can see, they're not kind of, they're not, um, forming together. So it makes it easy to uh, get a handle on that number. And then all we have to do is, well, if we use say a milliliter of our solution and we got 159 colonies, well, I have a hundred milliliters total. So I can backtrack that calculation and say, okay, I have approximately 6 billion bacteria in this solution of 10, mil 10 milliliters. 
So it's just a way of kind of counting the total solution. So what you're uh, visibly looking at are colonies, not individual bacteria, right? You cannot see a single one. But, exactly. Uh, but what you're looking at are these colonies and each colony, is it, uh, is it the same type? Um, you know, you said that there could be a distribution, but within the same colony, they are pretty much alike. So th this, these would all be the same bacteria, um, yeah. but each colony can be, it will have its own kind of variations, and mutations, um, but it, uh, each colony between the colonies, between CFUs will have their own mutations and variations, but the bacteria cells that are making up this, this, this clump colony, they should be genetically identical. Got it, got it. So here's some examples, um, you know, real life examples of plates. These are agar plates, and you can see that we've got these CFUs growing um, kind of independent from each other and kind of spread out. But these bottom ones right here that are getting kind of crowded and just too numerous to count. Um, you can imagine if we're sitting here and trying to count these as a human, um, you know, I might get to 985 and think, wait, was it 985? I was at 958. I, it, I'm, I'm backwards here. And, you know, every time you make a small counting error like that, you know, we're, we're, we're just statistically removing our, you know, accuracy. So it's important that you are accurate in these counts. And so it can become somewhat of a problem when you're counting manually. It's just very tedious work that has to be precise, but you want to do it quickly. And so, it, yeah, I mean, I, right. I can see why that would be a, just a big pain in the ass for lack of a better term. Yeah. When, so when I was actually a grad student, I worked on this problem of uh, cry electron microscopy. One of the problems there was exactly this kind of thing where you had to count, uh, not count, actually locate uh, protein macromolecules, which were frozen in ice. Uh, so that's, the, that's where the cryo part of the cryo electron microscopy came from. And in those, uh, the very first meeting I had with the person, it is fascinating because, you know, uh, she, she showed me uh, a micrograph which had all these particles, right? And the micrograph was so noisy that I could not see anything. So I stood there, you know, for one minute. Uh, she was explaining and I was waiting for the, uh, she was explaining everything and, you know, I was just listening because waiting for the picture to come up. And the whole, you know, one, two minutes go by, she explains everything and she, she says, what do you think? I said, show me the picture, I'll tell you what, what I think. So that is the picture. And it was like, you cannot see anything in that, you know, uh, pretty much it was, uh, and then she would zoom in and show me, oh, you see this little thing here? So, but uh, fortunately, you know, I was surprised that you could actually use computer vision techniques to detect all those as well. Uh, there was enough signal for humans to, recognize so there was enough signal for computers to recognize also so um, yeah so that you know these problems uh, sometimes can be looking you know very hard but if a human can solve a problem uh, of this kind visual problem then given the current state of uh, the art in computer vision we uh, can automate the process go ahead totally agree yeah. I totally agree. These uh, problems exist, uh, you know, all over the place. And I know for, for, for experience in, uh, in science, but I'm, I mean, I'm sure in engineering, art, everywhere, that, uh, you know, tedious visual problems that computers could easily detect. Yeah. Um, so when I do this counting, um, you know, by hand, it's, it's literally, I take a plate like this, they're about the size of your palm, and mm -hmm. I, uh, the actual plate, and I take a marker and I kind of dot each one. And so, you know, between 50 to 200 or 300, and I, I sit there and dot them. It takes me about two minutes or so, three minutes maybe for each plate. Um, I right. know some faster people can, uh, they can do it in as little as a minute. So it, it doesn't seem like as much of a problem. Um, however, uh, what the issue you run into is that you're not, you're not always doing, or pretty much never doing one plate. It's um, one plate per strain. So maybe you're using, you know, five, three, five, three, four, five different strains of bacteria, and you need to do each one in triplicate or duplicate, so two or three, to make sure you know you're getting enough power in your in your for your statistics. So you know, if we're doing five strains, three plates each, we're up to fifteen plates. Maybe you have two or three different time points. Uh, maybe you have some other variables that you worked into there. 
So now all of a sudden you're up to 20 plates or 30 plates and your one minute for each plate or two minutes for each plate is becoming 30 minutes to an hour. That could be every day. And that could be, um, everyone in my lab has to do go over this um, process. So that could be five or six people who are spending 30 minutes to an hour or two hours um, dotting the back of a plate, which right. they could be doing incredible things with their incredible minds that are more, much more complicated than, um, than a, no, computers. Right. But uh, there, is, there is one more thing I would like to add to that. Uh, and we were discussing right before the uh, webinar is that when we talk about solution, computer solutions, we do not have to restrict ourselves to human scale. So right now, the number of, uh, you want to keep it at a manageable level of, uh, you know, 100, 100 or so uh, colonies, CFUs. But uh, if a computer is doing, you could actually take a picture of many of these uh, Petri dishes at once. Let's say you could take a picture of 100 of them, as long as the resolution of the camera is big enough. And you could do the analysis on 100 times the data instead of restricting ourselves to human scale of you know, 100 or so. So that completely changes the game. Your statistics are more robust. Uh, it's done immediately and you can carry on with your experiment. The other thing is um, uh, when, you know, when I was again a grad student, uh, one of my lab mates, uh, I, was, I was waiting for some results to come out uh, when we were doing some experiments and it was taking about five minutes or so, right? And he said that, why don't you optimize it? I said, it's taking only five minutes, I can just wait. He says, no, the level of experiments you can do something that runs in 30 seconds versus five minutes it is insane. Just that five minutes, right? Just the fact that you have to wait for five minutes, it can waste so much of your time versus something that goes in 30 seconds. So I spent the day optimizing it, brought it down to you know uh, less than a minute uh, and it changed the game for me, right? I could do the experiment so fast. Uh, it, it changes the game, even that little 5X uh, difference. So yeah, uh, those are the two things I wanted to just point out. Yeah, there's a, there's, a, some, there's a saying, I don't know if I got get it right, but I, I use it sometimes in, in my lab, which is uh, when, I'm, when I'm trying to like figure out, you know, maybe this could be done faster in a different way. I, I'll, I'll say like, don't underestimate my ability to use six hours optimizing a 30 second problem right. <laughs> into, you know, a two second automated problem. Right. Right. But it adds it's, it's up eventually. Double-edged sword for sure. Well, it scales up, right? Uh, it adds up for you. For right. you, it may just save, uh, you know, uh, a little bit of time. But then your lab mates also benefit from your uh, right. innovation. And that's where the scale comes in. Right. Exactly. Uh, you, you touched on a point there that I think is a really, you know, I'm really running into it with this um, project, which is, you know, the use of these, these plates. Um, the, one of the biggest uh, difficulties I'm having is sort of the manipulation of the physical plate with the Lego Technic, um, especially taking the lid off. And I think the reason that is, is because um, these plates were designed to be easiest for the hands to use, for humans to use. Yeah. So what, what we run into is often like the optimization using automation of, of these problems from the human perspective of the problem. So so like I said, I'm trying to figure out how to use the computer vision to count 100 colonies. When you immediately said, why, why is it got to count 100? Humans can count 100. This can count you know, more than 100. Or you, know, you can only count one plate. This can count 10 plates. Um, and the same with this dish. It wasn't designed for uh, necessarily automation. It was designed for me to open up. So um, maybe you know, looking at these problems, you kind of like kind of have to backtrack a little bit and remember to how to best optimize the, automate the problem solution rather than automate the human solution to the problem. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, another analogy would be that, let's say you want to uh, build a security camera, right? Uh, and uh, humans, if humans, the way they uh, inspect things is, oh, I'm looking this way, I cannot look behind. For looking behind, I have to turn around and look behind. But if you're de designing a security system, you're not going to design a camera which looks this way and then turns around and looks that way. Uh, there's a lot of mechanical, uh, uh, you know, mechanically that's inefficient. You just put another set of cameras looking back. Literally you, right? eyes in the back of your head. That's what, that's yes. all we need. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Right. Sorry. That was a diversion. Zach, go ahead. No, it illustrates the point perfectly. 
So um, yes, we have these CFU colony forming units that are, um, each one is sort of genetically homogenous in each of these um, white dots. And um, all of the white dots are the same bacteria, but they are potentially uh, mutated or slightly different genetically. So the basic idea to the problem was that, um, you know, we have these stacks of maybe, for example, here's, uh, I don't know, 10 plates. Um, and I would, we would first remove the, we have to remove the plate from the stack because we can't, you know, read them in a, an entire stack. We might be able to read 10 plates at once sitting side by side, but as they are, when we use them and, and carry them and move them in these stacks, we can't, uh, you know, see. So you have to remove in each individual plate from the stack and then remove the lid. And the reason that I've decided to go about removing the lid is because when we count them, we turn them over and just sort of um, dot the bottom of them. But the problem that we were running into, or I've heard of as well, when it came to using like the apps and your phone is that sometimes these um, CFUs grow on the sides of the plates. And so from the top down perspective, it's it, you can't see those. Um, and then also this plate is uh, this plastic that also can, um, reflect light and then so you start you're getting these glares that um yeah you know even my um my my, my current um um some of the pictures i've taken for my for for optima or for training my model um have the lid on and i'm taking the picture with the lid on and the lid can cause the glare as well so um the solution to this problem to me was to just you know what instead of taking a picture of the bottom with the, the plate or taking a picture from the top with the lid is just to take the lid off and take a picture directly on to the agar. Um, then I, I can get, yes. Can I give a suggestion? I, I have not seen the rest of your slides, so I don't know whether you have already come up with the solution, but one solution in this case, in this case, and correct me if I'm wrong, this is completely transparent, right? The yes. backlighted. So if you put this uh, against a monitor in a black room, I mean, you can finally design something else, but the, to test whether the solution will work or not is that a, go into a dark room, turn on the monitor, put this against a white uh, monitor, like put, make the huh. monitor white and then take a picture. So this backlighting, uh, if that works, you will see that everything shows up because the black dots, the dots would be blocking it. And you can do it with a flash, you know, uh, if flash doesn't affect your uh, organ, uh, you know, the oh. body, do it with a flash uh, and you will get perfect segmentation of, um, of your colonies. So and all you need to do is- um, You're saying like count the shadows instead of the- Right. And invert it. You can also invert it and you get perfect alpha math. Um, so this is a standard technique uh, in, uh, you know, alpha matting when you want to do uh, some like we, we did some jewelry segmentation at one point and it was very difficult to do because jewelry has this, um, you know, it is shiny sometimes and things like that. You cannot do green screen matting because it would reflect, the green screen would reflect on the jewelry. So it would look really bad, right? So we took right. two pictures, one with a regular RGB and the other one was a backlit uh, photo, right? So uh, the light from the back, uh, is obstructed by this jewelry. We put the jewelry on a transparent mannequin and uh, lit it from the back and you get this perfect segmentation. You invert the mask, do some cleaning and you get this perfect segmentation and uh, you know it works beautifully. So something worth trying for this uh, problem if, you, uh, if that's an option. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even uh, so just the backlighting in general, I mean, it, it Potentially, it could lead to more accurate, um, even when still using all the same uh, ideas I'm using here. It could, it yep. might lead to more accurate counts in the, from the, the from the model. So I mean, the glare is gone. Right. The, the most important thing is that the glare is completely gone when you're backlighting it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, counting these uh, bacteria, we uh, decided, you know the best way would be to kind of pop the lid off, take a picture directly onto the plate. Then we can see everything, even the ones growing on the sides from this um, above view. Um, it also started working in my head that sort of um, the only thing we do from outside of the plate when it comes to the actual science that people do using Petri dishes, the only thing we do from outside of the plate is view it, is basically, you know, take a picture with our eyes or take a picture with a camera. Um, everything happens inside the plate. So if we were able to develop a, 
you know, an automated way to get that lid off. We're not just think we're not just talking about um, snapping pictures anymore. We're talking about we could you know add things to the plate. We could um, add the add the bacteria to the plate. Pick mm. off colonies from the plate. You know, it really opens the doors to what we can automate um, with this process. So um, remove the plate, remove the lid, scan the plate with the Oak Delight, and then um, backtrack on our on the robot to basically put these um, plates into a discard stack that I can come grab, pick up the stack and go on my merry day. So rather than this uh, stack of 10 plates taking me 15 minutes, I would hopefully be able to set the stack down, uh, have it run through them, basically just you know snapping a photo and counting the, the CFUs. And um, I hopefully wouldn't even be able to go do very much, honestly, uh, for 10 plates. I'd have to come right back and grab the stack and I'd have a nice list of, uh, of see a few counts ready for me that are accurate and uh, I can use for future science, whether that, whether that be um, uh, counting the number of bacteria for use in an experiment, or maybe, maybe the amount of bacteria on the plate is the experiment. Maybe I treated two different plates, what is this? Uh, two different plates with- uh, Friggin' auto updaters, man. They get you every time. Huh. Yeah. Uh, one plate I treated with a drug or uh, some sort of probiotic, and I want to see, okay, if I treated this bac this bacteria with the probiotic, this bacteria without the probiotic, how is the growth difference? And then I so take the picture, take the picture and count each one. And uh, now we're doing an entire experiment basically with, uh, you know, with the Oak Delight and uh, this easy automation that is um, easily to, easy to build, cost for and really we can put this on a bench top as opposed to like I said there are some other types of automated uh, methods that are very large scale in in, in uh, the scientific field and I'm sure in engineering and others uh, a lot of these um, sort of automated processes are humongous um, sort of right. uh, expensive very expensive um, pieces of equipment that can hardly fit on bench tops so um, big enough uh, that you refer to it as an apparatus right right <laughs> right. <laughs> Uh, for people who do not know, uh, the goal of this competition, there were two requirements of this competition. First of all, the problem uh, should be solved using Oak Delight, which is um, a smart camera uh, by Luxonis. Uh, and we have made it in collaboration with OpenCV and Luxonis. So Oak Delight had to be used. And the second thing was that it needed to be, it needed to use uh, a Lego uh, robot. So a robot made of Legos. You could choose from many different kits, but uh, that was the goal. And um, what Zach is showing are both components, the Lego robot, as well as uh, the computer vision part, which was done using Oak Delight. And you can buy your own Oak Delight at store.opencv.ai. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, uh, all right, so the... Uh, um... So the Lego kit that I've, I'm, I'm utilizing here is the Lego Robotic Inventors kit. And uh, so in order to first attack the problem, I first had to get to know the uh, equipment, the software, the hardware, and really um, know what I'm dealing with in order to utilize that to as a tool to make the uh, automation process. So first I decided to tackle um, both the uh, ejector method for getting these plates out of the stack of plates, as well as sort of what, what's gonna go into making the claw that's going to be able to grab the lid off of each one of these plates because uh, it's it's a very fine. Uh, I don't know if I can share myself here. No, well, uh, unshare your screen. Unshare your screen oh, so that okay. your picture would be big. Yeah. Now uh, so it's a very um, it's a pretty delicate operation for a Lego uh, gripper. Right. It's a pretty delicate operation for my hands, to be honest with you. <laughs> Uh, so that's why, um, that was definitely going to be, definitely is the most challenging part. I mean, I'm still working on it to this day. Um, Zach, in terms of your background, uh, I mean, obviously your background is in biology, but, uh, did you have a lot of programming experience prior to this project? So I, I, I don't know if I'd say a lot, I'd say some, I uh, took a, a couple courses, um, at the university of Iowa when I was there. And then I've also, I do a lot of self-learning iowa uh, kind of, that's great. yeah i uh so i do a lot of self-learning and um so like uh 
I kind of make my own curriculum off of online materials and, you know, Coursera, uh, Code Academy, um, Khan Academy, all the different ways to sort of put together. So I have a little, a mixture of, uh, you know, Python, JavaScript, and um, C++. I um, play around with Unity a lot. So before I got to work on um, the computer, this computer vision problem, I was, um, I was really into playing on Unity and sort of learning how to uh, build sort of 3D models on that. Tinkercad, um, uh, this little uh, Lego guy I got here, I got from entering a Unity contest where I made a um, Lego Unity uh, minifigure sort of uh, mini game. And so uh, nice. they, they gave these out, the cute little Unity figures. Um, so yeah, I'm always kind of finding ways to sort of like um, inspire and learn and uh, figure things out. And so robotics and uh, computer vision, as well as, um, you know, the computer science portion of it. This is all sort of like a hobby, a passion project of mine. Right. Um, and I just and think it really mixes well with the science too. Yeah, and career-wise, it makes a big difference if you uh, stack some of these talents, right? You have one thing, right? If you're an expert in one thing, that's something. But if you're an expert in two different domains and you can overlap them, you can use expertise in one. Like uh, a good biologist who is also an excellent programmer, right? you know, you won't find many of those and then you would be among the best in the world, right? So, sure. and add one more thing, let's say robotics, right? Or computer vision. And now you are definitely in the top 100 in the world, right? So adding some of these skills, stacking some of these skills together, it's a very good um, career, you know, uh, choice uh, when, when you do this. Definitely. I mean, when, uh, just even for, you know, in, in my lab, like scientific analysis, you know, we, 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 use different programming languages and like my prior some of my prior experience was able to make me jump on using you know some of the labs uh programming software for just for data analysis so like just in that environment the the there's a lot of crossover i was um showing this this presentation to some of my lab mates and uh, they were super impressed by the you know the robot and um which to me was interesting because like, I felt like when I showed the robot versus when I'm like introducing this biology, the people on this, uh, on this webinar who are watching, you know, from home, probably a lot of them have like robotics experience and they're going to be more impressed by the biology part of it. They're going right. to say, wow, that's incredible. And so, um, whereas they may, maybe not quite as impressed with the robotics because they're all building these at home themselves. So, uh, just, it, it made it easier, um, to be impressive just by having those two different kind of sides of things um when uh you know i'm i'm building it all my you know all myself you're using both sets of skills so just interesting what it impresses different groups of people yeah you got to be able to read the room yeah so um back to the um hardware software of the problem i have um one of the pre-builds that come uh, with instructions from the inventor's kit kind of comes with making of a claw. And I thought, well, that's a good way to start. Let's see what they recommend for um, making of a claw. So this um, claw here is off of uh, what I think is Charlie and um, it's basically color activated. So sort of learning the mechanism of turning rotational force into more of a linear closing grip force. Uh, how, how smooth is, are the servos on that? Are they they look, look pretty smooth. Yeah, yeah, they are definitely. Um, I, I've been impressed. It's all uh, they're very, um, very easy to use, and they're very. Um, I feel like it's very kid friendly. Like I feel like they're very robust. You you could toss this thing on the against the wall, pick it up, kind of twist it, play with it, chew on it, uh, and they'll still work. They still work quite smoothly. Yeah, our friends at uh, Cortec Technology have a really cool visual programming uh, setup that is compatible with this. You should, uh, folks out there should check out if they've got the Inventor Kit or are planning on getting it. Definitely. Um, so I knew, so, okay. So claw, claws are being done. Obviously claw methods are use robotic arms, hands, you've seen them. Um, so that's in the um, side of my mind when I was beginning this process. Um, and then I started wondering, okay, how am I gonna get the dish out of the, either the top of the stack or the bottom of the stack, or I guess the middle of the stack. Um, I began with sort of a um, first in, first out, um, approach where basically taking the bottom plate out of the stack and I began with this uh what I referred to as like a swinging arm hockey stick method uh which you know works 
I like I liked it. It, it kind of got the job done. Mm -hmm. But uh, it felt a little clunky to me, and it didn't feel as precise as I was hoping to get at. Um, so I kind of put that to the side. And, and um, all the Canadians in the chat are silently critiquing your stick technique. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so I moved on to um, this uh, this different form of dish ejector. It's a simple uh, rotation to linear mechanism, sort of using a um, just a couple of the Lego Technic beams, and it basically pushes um, the bottom uh, plate out from underneath, uh, which was exactly what I was going for, and it sort of does so in a linear fashion, which I wanted. Um, the only problem was that uh, it would push it, push the plate out. The rest of the stack would be sitting on top of this uh, linear actuator uh, type Technic beam. But then when it would pull back on the return stroke, the plates would just fall, fall straight down, which would be what I wanted, sort of a gravity feed type um, mechanism, except they didn't fall down straight down. They fell down sort of like the front end first because this, the beam came out. So I had this problem of, okay, now I've got this thing crumbling every time I try to push a push a plate out. So these are the kinds of problems that just keep emerging. You know, they just, you, you, you don't know it until you build it and you see it and you realize, ah, oh, yes, I got to fix this now. So I, um, the way I updated this was to use uh, a four bar linkage double rocker mechanism. Uh, the um, inspiration for this came from the, uh, the locomotive um, when I was picturing sort of a train and uh, how it's uh, it's a similar method to this the, the linear actuator sort of the arm that I had pushing the plates except once it gets its full the, gets the full stroke to um, the end it uh, it then descends down so basically lowering the stack um, all of it simultaneously back down to the platform returning the um, beam and then raising up again to uh, begin a new uh, begin a new stroke that's clever so. That's very cool and also very sounds very awesome. Four bar linkage double rocker mechanism is some serious <laughs> engineering sounding stuff. Uh, so I, I really like this uh, this one for solving that kind of that problem at, at the time. Or actually, this is still the current method I'm I'm using for this um, removing dish ejector, move, removing the plates. So uh, here are just a few photos of, of um, sort of midway through my uh, my build. I was having the um, the ejector eject these plates into this um, sort of next area of the of the robot where I would have the claw set up in order to um, grab or grip the lid, remove it for the next process, the the, the oak delight process. Um, I began with I began with a simple claw similar to um, the Charlie one we saw at the beginning of the uh, uh, presentation. Uh, how, however, um, although it, it, it uh, does grab the lid and uh, hold it, I found that it, it was just, I could not figure out a way to lift the entire claw that was uh, automated. I could do it with my hand there, obviously. But I just, it was heavy and it was just, it, it was never going to be able to get out of the way of the rest of the plate so that I could move it, either get the camera in there or get the plate out of there to the camera. So I had to um, basically scrap that entire claw. And I uh, came up with a second claw, um, grabber, gripper. And uh, this one was um, lighter and uh, could kind of get in there without causing too much, uh, taking up too much room. And I could lift it from the side as opposed to having to lift it from the top. I will show some examples here. Uh, what I liked about this was that I um, was able to um, add these four grippers onto each one of the claws or two grippers on each claw that really made sure I got a handle on the lid. It's important that uh, when grabbing the lid and moving it and replacing it, that it, it can't fall. It's basically that crumb that, that um, interferes with the entire process. If the, if the lid falls, 
basically it's it's like um the front person in the line tripping and everyone trips over them so this entire process has to be um pretty smooth very little room for error um introducing a little error um, at multiple stages you know those just multiply in the ad and uh will, will cause problems for the whole product. it seems like it could also follow your data up as well right like you you may you may screw up you know some of the colonies just by having it kind of jarred around a lot right yeah yeah definitely and you know drop the drop the lid on the, the plate inside on the agar like you could have a whole a whole a mess of issues so um i began feeling like the consistency here was not quite up to the par up to par for what i wanted um, but here's um the ejector followed by the claw sort of like showing what my thought process is for how i'm kind of wanting it to go about mm -hmm. So I like that a, you've got little Lego uh, bacteria in there as well for uh <laughs> yes yes I, I I definitely wanted to have some uh, Lego in there. Uh, here I have just a few kind of um, images to and videos to show some other parts of the um, the robot. So the first image here is sort of showing how I'm imagining the OPD light to be set up and um, potentially basically it'll be uh, facing downwards so that the um, plate can kind of slide in underneath it, or potentially uh, there's a possibility that the OKD light is the thing in motion itself where the plate stands still. I remove the lid and then the OKD light goes over the plate. Um, I haven't quite, um, uh, you know, for sure figured out which way it's going to go, but as of right now, it's most likely going to be the OKD light facing down and the plate being um, put underneath the plate and then removed. And the movement of all this after the dish is ejected and the claw removes the um, lid would be done on uh what, I'm th what i was thinking would be one of these platforms but that uh has evolved as well um so it might be using one of these platforms or it might be using more of a um, sort of a, a conveyor belt system i i, I haven't uh, completely completely gotten that taken care of as well um and then finally i decided that like i, I still didn't quite trust claw 2 uh so i sort of made a, 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 a some uh, some new some upgrades to it oops, to make it um, to where, you know, I didn't want it to do it until I got it. I didn't want to make the claw and, up, and optimize it until I could get the lid off the plate. I wanted to update and optimize the claw until I couldn't miss the lid. So there's a difference between getting it and not missing it. Right. And um, this um, claw, I felt confident that it's really made in such a way that it, it, re it really can't miss and it really can't drop. Um, so I was really, I, I became really happy with this. It's almost like a caliper style. Um, exactly. Kinda, yeah. Also things you probably only hear on OpenCV weekly webinar. I didn't trust Claw 2. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so to change gears a little bit, um, I've been going over sort of some of the automation problems, but I also needed the, um, the counting of the CFUs as well. And to do that, I, uh, I, I watching these webinars, I learned about RoboFlow and how they have this software set up to sort of help um, train models to uh, do anything from object detection to, for my example, um, CFU detection and counting. And uh, one thing I'd have to say is uh, they have really incredible uh, customer service. And I, I, I know uh, I've made this joke with some of my lab mates, this is, um, like I'm selling the product or something, but uh, they just, they contacted me like out of like on their own and they just have been nothing but try and help me and have been really personalized in helping. Uh, I, don't, I couldn't have probably learned how to use this um, software as quickly without uh, their assistance. Uh, and they've really taken uh, to, you know, take it almost personally to make sure that, you know, I, I, this project is moving along smoothly uh, and I've really appreciated it. Uh, you know, you really got appreciate when customer service really seems like they they care so uh yeah, yeah big shout out go ahead go ahead Cecilia. yeah well I, I was going to say the same thing that uh, we are lucky that we are working with uh these two groups of people roboflow is a silver member of OpenCV, and they are really excellent with customer service uh same with Luxanus. uh they are also really awesome with uh customer service on the hardware side so uh, we are, 
I mean, uh, it, it's not like, you know, it's a magic bullet or something. We just got lucky on both, <laughs> both those groups. Yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, uh, your your uh, your buddy Salo is in the in the chat here. He says he says uh, you're a legend, Zach. <laughs> Thanks, Salo. Um, if if anybody out there wants to uh, uh, sign up for RoboFlow, the best way to do that is go to RoboFlow.com/slash/OpenCV. Yeah, and also if you uh, would by any chance like a, a RoboFlow hat, um, after this uh, webinar, I'll be having. Um, if you go to my uh, Twitter, I'll be. Um, figuring out a way to do a raffle. If you just follow me and uh, you, I'll, I'll make a tweet basically about how I'll do the raffle and I'll be raffling off a, a RoboFlow hat. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, I'll, I'll be in contact with RoboFlow and we'll be able to get that all set up and get you a, a really cool RoboFlow hat uh, as soon as possible. So just uh, you know, follow me at Inoculum uh, LA on Twitter and look for that uh, raffle. Tweet. I've got one right here. It looks like this. Actually, I think the, uh, the one that... Um, uh, that I'll be raffling off is like a, a beanie with the uh, RoboFlow R. It's, it's really oh, cool. Oh man, yours is cooler. It, it's, so, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yeah, just so people know that uh, using RoboFlow was not, uh, not a requirement for the competition. So people are discovering uh, some of the tools by themselves. So uh, I just wanted to put it out there that it was not really uh, a requirement of the competition you discovered them and you've been working with with them yourself yeah definitely i uh, saw a webinar you did a few weeks back with joseph i think yep uh, uh and it was a uh, really some really interesting stuff and uh yeah immediately um they've been really helpful that that filthy iowan he will be back in a couple of weeks for another episode <laughs> by the way hey, we're, we're, we're both iowans right yeah mm. <laughs> and the two nelsons are not related Uh, so another um, kind of photo of what I'm working on over with Salo at uh, RoboFlow is um, training the model to detect these uh, CFUs. Um, at first, I basically trained it to um, detect any sort of bacterial colonies on these plates. But sometimes these colonies, even though we want them to be spread out, sometimes they do kind of end up touching or interacting. And um, what we don't want, so that'll turn the shape from a circle to maybe like a, a figure eight or um, just different morphology looking uh, things. And um, at first I was counting them as sort of like, okay, this is three that are just smushed together, tried counting it as three individuals. But, um, you know, RoboFlow has been really helpful in kind of helping me um, tweak this model so that it can um, recognize different, um, uh, different morphologies here as, you know, as either a two CFU or a three CFU um, to uh, help make the you know, accuracy of the whole thing um, better. So even after I thought, you know, okay, this solves the problem. I can just, I can detect these colonies. We're good to go. Um, they were still uh, adamant that, you know, well, we can, we can make this better. Uh, we can, um, rather than trying to uh, tease out the three colonies in the smush ball, let's teach it what three colonies looks like. And then, you know, of course, at a later point, I can, you know, tell it, divide that number by three, and that's how many single colonies there were there. So um, yeah, I just continued support uh, continued uh, help with this project. Quick question. Why is the slide from the side? I would have imagined that you would put a top down view, uh, but this one is from the side. Sure. Uh, so I guess my, my, my idea and uh, correct me if I'm wrong here. I, this was just sort of the original pictures I began taking was I didn't want to immediately teach it like, so when I set this up so that the camera, the OPD light is going to be taking this picture, it's going to be in the absolute perfect condition, lighting and um, angles as I can. I right. wanted to, I guess, make, I was trying to take pictures that would sort of challenge and um, uh, give it the, almost some of the worst scenarios. Worst scenarios. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's, yes. that's a perfectly valid thing to do. Yeah. Um, and I mean, even like, I don't even know if it'll be this far away. So yeah. um, we might, this, this um, model might be training at a, a further distance and being able to pick off these small colonies, uh, you know, so hopefully when I, you know, really shove it in the Oak Delight's face, it will, it'll just be like, oh, this is easy, you know, Try, train harder, play hard, train harder kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, as long as, uh, you know, a vast majority of your, uh, uh, let's say 80% at least are from the top down view, right? Yes. Adding these uh, would help, but uh, don't make the mistake of adding only these and not, no. uh, yeah, of course. I just check. Yes. <laughs> yep. Uh, we have a we have a number of them. Uh, see, that was another thing. I wasn't sure kind of how many. And RoboFlow has kind of helped me um, sort of put a minimum on the number of pictures. I think I have about 
um, uh, I don't know, 45, 50 photos that are annotated. And we're doing about 70% of them in the uh, training set and 20% um, in the validation set and 10% in the test set. So um, I think, yeah, most of them are of some sort of top-down measure, but um, yeah, I, I definitely threw in some that were sort of challenging. I mean, if you take a look, you can even see, I'm counting uh, CFUs on, on the very bottom of this picture through the side of the glass even. Right. Um, and I, I would never challenge in actuality to, to, to uh, uh, count these through the side of the, the glass. So I mean, it's, it's impressive that they're still detecting uh, through the side. Right. And the benefit yeah. of uh, doing this can also be that uh, when you uh, move to a non-robotic solution, let's say you want to create an app uh, using the same model where you cannot guarantee that people would be following instructions, uh, but it's a cell phone app, right? In that case, the same model uh, would just work out of the box. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, we're, we're coming up on 9.55. I'm going to pause oh. so we can do our trivia giveaway just in case uh, anybody has a hard stop. Um, Zach, would you mind unsharing the screen real quick here? Sure. Yep. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. So uh, this is the OpenCV weekly trivia giveaway portion of the show. The way this works is folks in the Zoom chat are going to answer a question that I'm going to ask based on the slides. The first person to answer that question correctly, as it shows up on my screen, will win $200 worth of Microsoft Azure credit from our generous sponsors on awesome Intel hardware. So get ready to answer. And if you've won anything in the last, say, two months, please don't answer. Let somebody else get a chance. So we've been hearing a lot about a, an acronym, CFU. What does that stand for? <laughs> Dan, you got me, bud. You got me, bud. I'm getting way too predictable. This is Dan, Dan Beavers won this one. He had it typed out before I even asked it. I, 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 <laughs> Get out of my head, Dan. Questions. Get out of my head. Oh, that was fast. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, Dan, please send an email to phil at opencv.org, and we will get you your Azure credits courtesy of Microsoft. Uh, thanks to, uh, to Sharon at Microsoft for hooking us up with those. You, you should you should throw a curveball next time, something like, you know, uh, uh, you know, you heard the term CFU. It obviously stands for such and such. I'm just going to pull a Bilbo Baggins and ask everybody what's in my pockets next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Zach, continue, please. Sure. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, really quickly, where is the where, share screen? I uh, uh, I thought it was a good idea, um, sort of what you were bringing up. So I thought I'd maybe uh, quickly go through a couple of these um, photos here once I. And so um, these are some of the different photos on Robo. Can you see these? Yeah. Yeah, these are some of the different photos that uh, taken, um, as well as some, you know, blanks, some null photos as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and here, um, this goes back to what you're saying about the phone and the app and what, whatever. I'm actually kind of moving the camera a little bit. So there's a little bit of smear. So mm -hmm. it's kind of learning, um, you know, what that looks like as well. Uh, so we just got, we have a lot of different angles and kind of uh, views to, to, to pick from. And uh, it's really coming along. It's really, it's really coming along. That's great. All right. Now bring back up. This. So again, uh, check out my Twitter after this, and I'll be holding a raffle for RoboFlow hat. Uh, and then I can't obviously do this without um, mentioning OpenCV. Uh, yeah, they've been nothing but helpful, and um, I've been taking one of the course. Well, I went over, I went through and sort of took the uh, crash course, or kind of did the crash course, and I realized like, okay, this is some good stuff. Uh, you know, they're obviously passionate about this, so. I signed up for the OpenCV for beginners and I'm on um, uh, module four right now. And um, it's really catching me up to speed on different ideas that are coming in handy, such as thresholding and, um, you know, just everything. I, I, was, I had no computer vision experience going into this and just some minor programming experience. And um, just so far, even this um, OpenCV for beginners has been super helpful, um, especially with this project. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
And I actually did not know that uh, right before the show we were talking and you mentioned it, but before that, I did not know that you had taken the course. Uh, I'm glad that it's useful. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and for folks uh, listening out there, watching out there, it's opencv.org slash courses. Yes. And uh, a quick shout, uh, quick shout, how can I go back here? To Luxanis as well. Um, I actually, um, who are Luxanis working with uh, OpenCV with the Oak Delight. It was the Oak Delight I saw on Kickstarter. Um, that was what kind of opened my mind to all of this. I was just sort of going through Kickstarter uh, at the normal tech stuff that I look at and I saw the uh, Oak Delight and then I was like, oh, I need, this seems like a great intro to uh, computer vision. And then one thing led to another, I saw this contest and you know, here we are. So um, thanks to Luxanis. Also um, the CEO, Brandon, who um, he's been a great help with, um, when I first got the Oak Delight, I was sort of like, you know, what do I do with this? But um, he showed me the, you know, the, doc the documentation is really simple, straightforward, Oak Delight up and running in no time. And, um, you know, he's just, he's always helpful. Their entire um, Discord is super helpful. Tons of um, different moderators um, who are willing to answer um, any type of question you've got. I've always got the simplest questions on there, but I'm, I'm always a simple question kind of guy. I'm not really uh, afraid to show what I don't know. So um, yeah, definitely uh, look, check out Luxanis and uh, the Oak Delight. So with the current models, uh, what kind of accuracy are you getting? Uh, will, um... I mean, by the end of the you, the contest is still, you know, the the deadline is uh, more than a month away. But uh, do you expect to beat human level accuracy or meet um, the same level uh, of accuracy by then? Um, so I don't have an exact number right now, um, yeah. but uh, right now it's it's looking pretty promising. I'm I'm hoping to meet human level accuracy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because again, uh, one of the issues with why we, you know, we decided not to use the, the app, some of the apps that are available in the lab is because, you know, even a 10% uh, miss on accuracy overall uh, could be yeah, 10 catastrophic with, with, yeah. Uh, the, with the scientific um, method and uh, what yeah. we're using it for. So if we're looking at uh, counting colonies at around 100 CPs per plate, um, even going from 90 to 110, um, that 10% inaccuracy can be a problem. Um, I imagine that humans probably do have a, we do miscounting probably, you know, between five, zero and 10%. Uh, so yeah. within that range, I'm not looking quite for perfection because I don't think anything is perfect, obviously. And some of these CFUs are very close together. So I, I'm hoping um, that uh, between myself, the Oak Delight, RoboFlow um, and you know, OpenCV, we can all kind of, uh, it'll, it'll get there hopefully. So by any chance, uh, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but by any chance, uh, would, there, uh, would there be an opportunity for people to get access to the raw data uh, you have so that other people can also contribute a model or try uh, training a model using the data that you have? Um, that's something that I'll have to uh, look into for uh, at a later date. Um, yep. So, uh, you know, I have these print offs that I got from online of, yeah. uh, of, of these colonies, but um, some of these, um, the, the actual colonies I have are of, um, you know, uh, a few of them are from plates from like my lab. And so I'm not sure if uh, those would be uh, uh, made to be shareable for the whole world, but um, I could definitely, you know, use this model to uh, train off of uh, images, you know, Google images and uh, such, and people could then use that model um, further on I, I want to i would make it as much public as i can obviously that's great because what i'm thinking is that you have this automated setup now you know you can quickly go through many of these uh pictures perfectly taken pictures right and now the once you have this automated setup the problem becomes a computer vision problem to solve right how well how uh, accurate can you get on the model and just like the netflix prize you know uh, netflix had been working on this um uh, uh, recommendation engine for uh, for a long time, and they made this Netflix Prize a competition, and their internal algorithm was, I mean, their team had been working on it for several years, but within days, I remember, uh, if I'm not wrong, within days, people were able to beat uh, Netflix's algorithm, right? And several teams, it's not like one. So when you put out things like this to the community, uh, and they are ready to share back uh, the model, this thing can be much, it will surpass human level accuracy uh, without any doubt. I don't have any doubt. 
Oh, for sure. You know, I, I mean, this whole like having us all connected with the internet and it's, it's crowdsourcing in the mind, basically everyone's minds. I mean, I'm just hoping somebody is looking at something I've said here and it's just like, oh, I've got the, I, no, let me just, you know, tweet at this guy and tell him like, this is going to make things, you know, much smoother or something like, please tell me, I mean, if something just is inspired in you, please tell me. Um, Cause I'm just one mind, but you know, however many are watching this, I'm sure. Yeah. Like you said, it's just, it's exponential. Yeah. Um, okay, let's uh, go ahead. Do you have uh, more slides? Uh, just two more. Just I wanted to thank Lego Mindstorms, Microsoft Azure uh, for sponsoring. And then I wanted to thank, you know, my lab mates. They're um, very, um, they're very supportive of me with all of uh, my, not even just this, just whatever I, crazy ideas I come up with in lab and try trying out. Um, they're always, you know, um, humoring my curiosity. So thanks to them. And uh, with that, uh, again, follow me on uh, Twitter. And uh, thanks for listening. Thank you. Uh, we can ask, uh, get uh, user question. Uh, sorry, audience questions. Yeah, definitely. Um, Zach, would you do me a favor? And you had that last slide with your URLs and stuff. Can you put that up real quick? Because people were asking about it in the chat. OK, uh, sure. Let me. Well, I'm, well, I'm grabbing some questions here. Yeah, we've got some good ones here. This has been a really fun show. People are really really interested. Perfect. Thank you. I feel that, uh, that we got some more rubber duck content here for you. I love it. I love it. Love to see it folks. Um, and the unity shirt on the, uh, the little guy, does that, where'd you get that? So this, um, uh, there, uh, unity, uh, partners with uh, Lego on these, um, on these small contests to basically teach people how to make, um, micro games and, uh, and they do these contests all the time. And one of the, I, I entered one of the contests and everyone who entered, just entered, was sent one of these little Unity guys. That's so cool. Um, or girls. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, just check out yeah, Unity and, uh, and Lego. And uh, they do these, they teach you how to make a micro game with little Lego figure mini figures. And um, it's sort of an introduction to programming and like, uh, micro games. And they, they'll, they'll send you one of these just for entering. That's awesome. I'm jealous. We need open CV Lego minifigs. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, that's cool. You can go ahead and unshare your unshare your screen now. Um, yeah, so lots of really good questions here. Um, people are uh, really responding to the to the Lego and Petri dish show. Um, first question here is from uh, Niraj, who would like to know: Is there any weight difference in the plates between uh, one with a more dense colonies and uh, sparse colonies? Does that actually affect the the uh, math here at all in terms of your your servos and whatnot? Uh, no, I, they, it's negligible if, if anything. Yeah. They, uh, these, these are uh, very sort of almost tip of pen, tip of a pencil oh. sized light fluffy bacteria. So. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Um, Eli would like to know, um, is it, is it enough? Why isn't it enough to measure just the coverage in the Petri dish? Could you, could you just, Kind of segment it and then divide by the standard size of the of the cell to get uh, similar similar results in your data. Uh, that's a good question, uh, but uh, I guess I would uh, remind that the the number of CFU that we're counting is uh, not just um, sort of like a raw number of uh, bacteria, but also sort of the genetic diversity of the bacteria in your total solution. So 100 CFU isn't just 100 uh, CFU, it, it reflects um, the, the homogeneity and heterogeneity of the uh, uh, genetic profile of your bacterial solution. So are you saying that they could be of different kinds in, inside that 100? Uh... So th they're all the same bacteria. Well, if it's not contaminated or if you don't have multiple bacteria, yeah. It would be all one bacteria, but um, each each of the CFU each of the CFUs is its um, is its own specific, very specific genotype. So it'd be like if a hundred of us were standing in a room, we're yeah. all human, but um, right. we're all slightly different. Uh, um, so you could take a picture and say like, okay, a hundred people in the room are taking up this much space, but it's um, just as important to say, well, we have a hundred different uh, genetic makeups there. Um, that are the same species, but they, they're um, different. Got it. 
Yeah, thanks for that. Um, Timothy would like to know, are the colonies randomly distributed or is there an edge effect in the colony distribution? So that's a good question. Um, I would uh, say, so one of the issues, of course, with, with, um, with when I was using the, some of the apps was um, the fact that some do form on the edges, but um, the ones that form on the edges, it, it, it's mostly evenly distributed. The ways in which we um, get, get, I guess I didn't go over the method in which uh, we put these on there, which is you kind of just uh, squirt like, I don't know, like uh, let's say a hundred microliters. Um, if you don't know what that means, like imagine like, um, I don't know, an yeah. AirPod size amount, a drop, yeah. And then uh, two methods that are used. The method in, in my lab is we put, you know, maybe like 10 glass beads, tiny, like the size of the CFU, we just drop them on the agar. And then it's called the uh, Copacabana method. And then you just shake it and it sounds like a rattle. And the beads <laughs> are basically rattling around in there and they're covering themselves with the bacteria and they're just spreading themselves all over the plate. And, it's, and you know, you do it enough to hopefully, hopefully get uh, as homogenous as you can. Another method is called a, a like a hockey stick method type situation where you have like a glass rod that uh, is like a hockey stick and you just kind of spread it around on there. So more hockey. Uh, <laughs> more hockey content. We love to see it, yes. folks. So there's two methods and mostly, um, of course, you know, I guess it probably is easier for solutions to pool in the sides, but it's, it's, it's supposed to be homogenous as possible. That's great. So, and th that piece uh, in the long run, that piece can also be done using a robot, I guess. Exactly. You know, so you're starting to see like, it's very easy to pour those beads. It's very easy to, you know, squirt like a couple drops of liquid. Um, that could all be, uh, you know, just as easy as taking a picture potentially. Could, could you shoot the colonies from like a Red Ryder BB gun? <laughs> we can do whatever we needed to, yeah. One of the ways that we um, use these, um, this bacteria after we played it like this is you pick off one of the colonies with like a toothpick and that is supposed to represent, you know, homogeneous genetic um, uh, genotype. And so, and if we need to use that for something, I could imagine, you know, automating the process of just, you know, plucking off one of those colonies as well. So, I mean, this just opens the door to everything we do on a petri dish, you know. Yeah, very, very, uh, the, the, the mind reels at the potential. I uh, got one more question here from Michael who asks, could you could another method here be to take a binary image and just count the pixels because you know roughly the size of the the CFUs? Yes, that I've I've I've, I've um, kind of thought that, that thought about that before. Um, I think it'd be very easy to threshold this image uh, and make it binary. And um, I actually never thought about you know pixel counting. I I just figured you know turning it binary would just make it much easy, just as easy or more easy to sort of count them, but I mean, even pixel counting, yeah, if you could get the average pixels per CFU um, and then just count the total number of pixels and divide, yeah, that, that's a great idea. Cool, yeah. Um, we're about uh, 10 minutes past the hour. You wanna take us home, CTU? Yeah, thank you so much, Zach. Uh, it is incredible that, you know, uh, you, you're not only participating in this competition, you are actually, uh, you know, trying to surpass human level accuracy in, uh, in this domain. And it is going to be very helpful, not just to your lab mates, but other people in the field as well. I really like your spirit that you decided to join the competition and you, know, you tackle this problem, which you did not have any experience in before. So kudos to you. Um, thank thank you. you so much. Yeah. And as always, uh, Phil, uh, thank you for organizing the show and managing uh, OpenCV weekly webinar and other things. And uh, last but not the least, thank you, everybody, our audience. Uh, you mean a lot to us, and it keeps us motivated to come here every week and deliver uh, interesting content. Uh, before we leave, I just want to give uh, a last uh, you know, notice to people that uh, our Kickstarter campaign for deep learning with TensorFlow and Keras is still on. We just crossed um, $100,000 in the first 36 hours, and now we are at about 300 uh, backers. So those two milestones have been crossed. If you're interested, please go and check out our uh, Kickstarter campaign. That's uh, all I wanted to uh, 
mention in this webinar. Yeah, um, next week we will have another great team from the OpenCV Spatial AI Contest, as well as uh, maybe a little more of a teaser for the forthcoming OpenCV AI game show. Yeah. Uh, one last thing, one last thing. Uh, I really want to thank our sponsors, uh, Microsoft, Azure, and Intel for this uh, organize for helping us organize this contest it uh, they have been our sponsors for the last uh, few contests it's awesome uh, big shout out to them thanks so much for watching this episode of the webinar please hit that like button subscribe and don't forget to tap the little bell icon to be notified when new episodes drop this week's episode was brought to you by intel and microsoft azure as part of opencv spatial ai contest Follow along with the Oak Delight Contest hashtag. If you'd like to be in the audience next week, subscribe to the OpenCV newsletter.